you know, it's uh, something we've been saying for some time at RK Equity, you know, US is the sleeping giant. So, you know, I've raised the issue is it's not about sales, it's about sales. In 2025, it's not inconceivable that the US will deploy more battery cells, gigawatt hours than China in the EV market. It sounds the US to have, um, I guess, uh, smarter supply chains starting from the cell all the way back through to mines. Well, what I, one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately is what it's going to take to move the obstacles out of uh, EV makers ways, like for instance, Tesla. It looks like we're going to have had a serious material bottleneck in the next few years on about every material that goes into batteries. And I have a feeling when that happens, and it's, it's gonna be happening exactly at the time that EVs are starting to gain a lot of popularity and traction in the US. And I think once that happens, I think, regulators, or I hope regulators jump in and they start doing some serious thinking about this and they, uh, they start moving regulations out of the way. Yeah, that, 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 that's, a, that's a good point. I mean, to me, one thing I find interesting is, is I think by the time Biden's term ends, EVs will be as cheap, if not cheaper than internal combustion engines. So Regardless of what happens in the next elections, EVs are in full swing. But yeah. Now the total market of lithium and nickel and graphite and all of these things is sort of growing at 25% plus, and you can't scale production at that rate, so you, et cetera. But what I don't understand is if you look holistically at the whole globe and saying, if we are to make this as a, a universe of people, you should develop the lowest sustain, you know, lowest environmental impact, the lowest CO2 project should be developed. And it might happen to be the one that you're disputing, but you don't care if they build it in China because you don't live in China. And I'm not sure I understand that logic or some other part in Asia or you know, nickel deposits in Indonesia where they're going to put, they want to put tailings on the seabed and you've got to fight it. Do we, should we be approaching this whole clean energy revolution from a holistic perspective as a universe of people. And to my mind, that's what you should be doing. And not only do we have to get all these battery electric vehicles on the road, which limit the amount of CO2 going into the air, but we also have to make sure that the materials that go into those come from clean supply chains as well. So I'm totally on board with you. And I, I guess to put a finer point on what I was saying a moment ago is I don't see how these EV credits help. Um, the issue is with supply. So what we need to do is we need to cut the red tape for these mines. And I think the mines that are going to going to be in the US and North America are going to be much cleaner and much better in terms of CO2 than the stuff we get from China. So we should help clear the way for them. That is, that is exactly, you know, my thoughts and, and, um, but a lot of the other companies, I just, I don't see them making it because it's going to be, it's, it's going to be musical chairs. with raw materials. And there's not going to be enough chairs when everybody sits down, there's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be some people that are left out and they don't. VW at their power day, they said they're, you know, they're going to bring cell production in house, but it didn't look like they were looking at raw materials at all. And that's where everything's at. That's where everything's going to be for between 2023 and 2026. 
or even starting this year, as you said. But, but with, with, yeah. that, with that said, uh, Jordan, the one, the one thing, so we're a hydroxide guys, we've sort of pushed, but that is on the performance EVs, which we think still have a long way to go, specifically in the US and in Europe, and possibly even into aviation as one goes, the high nickel, light batteries, you know, for, but I am, a, I am pro LFP in terms of the energy storage and, and so on. So from that perspective, you know, if you're talking 60 to $80 per kilowatt hour at the pack level, you can electrify almost anything. And that's where I see renewables with energy storage as a huge, huge market for LFP. And speaking to our guys, they agree with you in terms of look at what goes graphite wise goes into LFP. And it's exactly what you're saying. The key element to it Charge and discharge from a renewables backup perspective, you want cycle life. Yeah, so it's, uh, I think the future is bright for graphite. And it, uh, I've had quite a few discussions with people online. There's, there's a lot of hype around silicon. Uh, there's quite a few people that thought Tesla unveiled a pure silicon anode at battery day. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's it's it's just not the case. That's years down the road, it, if not later this decade or early next decade. But think mm -hmm. about it, Jordan. What performance can you get out of increasing the silicon doping from six percent or whatever it is, or around ten to fifteen to twenty? It does phenomenal things. Yeah. I don't think people understand how good the battery is going to be at fifteen to twenty. Yeah, you're going to get fast charging. Uh, is going to be. Besides the higher energy density, you're going to get fast, charge, fast charging capability with high silicon. So I think people are going to be surprised what a dash of silicon can do. And, and that's my point is it's the enabler. Everyone said, you know, they misread that thing. What we're saying and what, what the guys we speak to in the graphite world are saying is, no, no, putting that extra bit of silicon in is going to, if anything, is going to secure the future of graphite. It's going to expand the market of graphite because A is cheap to put the silicon in and the performance is phenomenal. 